Good evening and welcome to Resource PNG. In this edition, we feature reports that focus on converting resource rent, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, EITI, and we feature interviews with the Managing Director of IPBC and we talk to the State Enterprise Minister. It is a constant wonder for many Papua New Guineans why, despite being a resource-rich nation, resource rents are not trickling down to the ordinary Papua New Guinean citizen. We take a look at this report by Martin Namarong that sees how the PNG government intends to convert resource rent into national development. Papua New Guineans always seem to wonder why, despite the multitude of extractive industries in the country, resource rents do not seem to be trickling down to a lot of people. By 2015, the nation may be able to achieve the glory of hosting the South Pacific Games, but it would fall short of achieving the Millennium Development Goals. All this despite the fact that there has been an average annual economic growth of 6%, fueled by the recent resource boom. In addition, the big four mining companies in PNG, Leher Gold Limited, owned by Newcrest since 2010, Oil Search Limited, Octedi Mining Limited, and Pogra Joint Venture recently paid on average 1.6 billion kina in taxes each year, representing 17% of total government revenue. Their average annual procurement of local goods and services was around 1.6 billion kina. The PNG LNG project alone has pumped 8 billion kina into the local economy thus far. Following the money trail has been difficult. In 2012, the National Research Institute published a report titled Load Shedding, a case study of the economic benefits to the landowners, the provincial government and the state from the Pogra gold mine. The report stated, to the communities who are supposed to be the ultimate beneficiaries of PNG's mining and mineral wealth, the legal and payment system is complex, opaque and one-sided. There remains a critical lack of transparency at both the national and sub-national government levels. Audited payments made by the mining company to the government and various stakeholders can be tracked, however, the question of where these payments go and how they are spent once they leave the mine remains unresolved. The government has risen to the challenge of ensuring transparency by supporting the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. So there are differences around at a recent budget forum hosted at the National Research Institute, it was revealed that there has been a mixed picture in terms of the development outcomes arising from the expenditure of resource rent. Researchers from the National Research Institute and the Australian National University presented the findings of a recent budget survey they conducted that compared their findings with those of a similar survey done in 2002. They concluded that improvements in local governments may improve efficiency of converting natural resource wealth into sustainable human development. Lead researcher Professor Stephen House from the Australian National University commented that whilst there have been significant improvements in education as a result of the fiscal expansion caused by the resource boom, health indicators have been declining. So we decided to do this research precisely to ask that question of whether PNG has been able to translate its uh, mineral boom into better services for the ordinary people. And um, but that, that's one of the key development challenges facing this country. And so to ask that question, you need to be able to look at data at two points of time to make the comparison. 
And we knew that NRI had done this study in 2002, which was just before the resource boom. So we thought that would be the ideal baseline to use. And so we decided for our survey to go back to uh, exactly the same provinces, uh, the same districts, uh, and the same schools and health centers as were surveyed in 2002, and look at what changes had happened over the last decade and whether things have got better for them uh, or for worse. Yeah, what's very interesting is that we had really very different sorts of findings for uh, health and education. So in education, we found a lot more kids uh, going to school. Uh, the number of kids uh, in school, enrolled and attending, uh, almost doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, there are more teachers uh, to teach those children. Uh, there are more classrooms. Uh, in general, the classrooms are of better quality. Uh, there are more textbooks. Are now available. So the picture uh, overall was quite positive for uh, education. Uh, but whereas for health, we found that actually the number of patients going to a health clinic on a, on a typical day had actually fallen by about 20%. Uh, the number of staff turning up to work uh, had also fallen. And the availability of drugs at the uh, average clinic had uh, decreased in the last 10 years. So we found, uh, of course, the education sector still faces lots of problems, but we could see there was progress being made, uh, whereas in the uh, health sector, uh, it looks like uh, the, clinics, uh, the performance of the clinics has, has really gone backwards. Professor House, however, cautioned that the results in some provinces showed significant deviation from the national averages. He also added that the research indicated strong relationship between local community oversight and service delivery outcome. We then tried to explain why has the education sector done better than the health sector. And one thing we noticed is that the schools seem to have much closer links with the communities than the health centres do. So the schools have a board of management and that has uh, teachers but also community representation. And then nearly every school has a PNC committee, a, a, a committee of the parents. Uh, and they meet uh, about three or four times a year on average. Uh, whereas with the uh, health clinics, uh, there's no board of management. There is a village health committee, but only about 60% of the health centres have a village health committee. And even when they have one, it only tends to meet about twice a year, so it's less, it's less active. Uh, so it does seem to us that there's more uh, local engagement betwe with, between a school and its community than between the clinic and its community. And perhaps that's one reason why uh, schools have performed better in the last decade. Two key stakeholders affected by the research were obviously the health and education sectors. Both had high level representations with the education department being represented by the secretary and the health department being represented by the deputy secretary. With the government's budget cycle now changed from annual to five year cycles, the Education Department has projected that its budgetary needs will double by 2018 to about 1.1 billion kina. Now, because the new budget cycle has changed, we have to think in five years. So, every government department, so the state board is thinking five years. So, I'm giving you the reality of what government department thinking the way you have to. So, you're going to uh, crucify government departments. Are you thinking the way you are? There you are. You have it. You're already thinking in five years. If you want to guess what kind of figure I want to have in 2018, I don't want anything less than 1.1 million for for education. More of this report after the break. We continue the report on how the PNG government intends to convert resource rent into national development. Putting the figure of 1.1 billion within the LNG context is critical as LNG revenues are expected to reach 2 billion kina per annum by 2017 onwards. As Dr. Jan Gotchak from the International Monetary Fund recently highlighted at the seminar at the Institute of National Affairs, LNG revenues may not be as significant in the broader scheme of things when one accounts for declining revenues from maturing mines. And the revenue projections for the LNG project look impressive indeed. So if this was all that we had to look at, I'd say indeed, golden times are ahead. 
But once you put that into the broader context, once you put that into the, uh, 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 once you generate the overall mineral revenue projections, I have to say, I was less impressed. Uh, it looked to me that for, to a significant degree, what the LNG revenue inflows do, they substitute for, for, for falling revenues from other sources. This, uh, uh, oil wells or mine, <coughs> mines enter, uh, nearing the end of, uh, uh, of the production cycle. Um, and back in the day, I kind of I was wondering what the fuss was all about. Uh, for the relatively poor in such a tighter fiscal environment going forward, Professor Stephen House observes a downside in allocating resource rents into the hands of politicians as opposed to expanding the recurrent budget. There's a risk in PNG that uh, the Recurrent funding for teachers and maintenance has been squeezed out by too much development funding. Uh, and now we have all the funding going to MPs and uh, to the governors. That's all for development funding. And that's making uh, much less room available for uh, funding for uh, more teachers. We've got to get more health workers uh, out to the clinics. Uh, we need more drugs. Uh, we need much better maintenance. Uh, so all of those are recurrent funding requirements. So I would think in a tighter fiscal environment, uh, there should be much greater emphasis on uh, getting a accountable but also a, a growing service delivery or recurrent budget. Dr. Thomas Webster, the director of the National Research Institute, therefore advocates wise allocation of resource rents for national development. In many ways, we can do a lot more with the little money that we have if we manage contracts well and if we look at quality interventions. Many people will come up with shopping lists. But you can achieve the same or at least most of the outcomes with a few interventions. And not trying to do too many things, but doing a few things well and making sure that these are done and then doing a few more. Because we are only humans. We can do only a few things at a time. And I think we need to recognize that human constraint. That we, our expectations, you know, like when we're hungry, we feel that, oh, we can eat a lot. But when you start eating, you realize that you only have a limited space in your stomach. And so in the same way, when it comes to budgets and things, you know, I see shopping lists coming from all over and saying, people say, we want to do this, we want to do this. But practically and realistically, we can only do a few things. And so it's important to prioritize and say, what are the most important things to be done now, this year, next year? And then as we implement, other more important things come on the horizon. And I think strategically we need to look at it so that then we can make, you know, make the most, uh, get the most benefits out of the things that we do. There are also capacity constraints at the national level that augment the conversion of natural resource rents into improvements in government service. As the governor of the central bank highlighted recently at the PNG Business Advantage Summit, such capacity issues may mean that 2013 may not be the year of implementation but the year of delays in project delivery. Preservations that uh, this year, uh, despite the high expenditure, most of the funds, some a good uh, amount of funds won't be used, but will be kept away for next year uh, because of capacity issues to implement those uh, uh, development projects this year. Uh, it's not a bad thing, it, they've done it in the past. Uh, the IMF said uh, in, the, in the recent mission, said uh, recommended that's a good idea um, so that it might ease pressure in next year's budget because you have to implement the economy has to implement those uh, uh, those projects that are planned for this year into next year, so you will have a, a spirit effect of deferment of some of those development projects into the following years. It is important to note at this juncture that the recent resource boom has allowed the government to triple funding for the health sector. However, this has not been translated into improvements in health service delivery. Allocating funding alone will not solve the issue if bottlenecks exist at the national level. Such bottlenecks at the national level mean people at the grassroots level have to wait longer for service delivery. So how can Papua New Guinea translate mineral windfalls into improvements in the livelihoods of ordinary people? At the national level, the government said that this is the year of the implementation and allocated huge amounts of money to national impact projects. It was surprising to see the Secretary for, and, and also pleasing to see that the Secretary for Planning said and acknowledges the problems of implementation. 40% in this is September and 40% of the funds allocated have been spent. Clearly there are problems with implementation at the national level, transfer of funds, project scoping and so on. 
And I think going into the future, we have to think about transferring monies and funds to local level, you know, provincial level, district level, but more importantly to the service providers at the school level, at the facility centers, health service, uh, health centers, sub-health centers, and so on, so that they have the funds there to spend on the things that they need. They can make the decisions about fixing uh, health workers' houses, purchase the drugs, provide the transport to come to town and you know, get the things that are needed and so forth, so that these services are available. Because at the national level, if we lump it under a national agency to spend it, then we can see the bottlenecks that these funds will not be spent. And at the end of the year, then they all go back to the to the public account system and we don't see that. So I think there's some important lessons in terms of how we can uh, improve services at the local level by transferring funds, but having account local accountability mechanisms in place and also the oversight mechanisms that the national level can provide. The past decade has seen improvements in the education sector that can be linked to the growth in the resource sector. As Professor Stephen House highlights, not all of Papua New Guinea's resource rent has been lost during the last decade, but there are important lessons from the past decade that can guide the country going forward as LNG revenues enter government coffers. Well, that's right. I think uh, what our research shows is you should be careful of generalizations and you should be careful of just uh, wiping off the last decade saying no progress has been made. Uh, PNG has shown uh, that it can absorb more money into its uh, schools and uh, can uh, teach more children. Um, so there is progress, but yes, I think there are definitely aspects of a lost decade, uh, especially in health. And what that shows us is that increasing funding is not enough, because in both uh, health and education there was a big increase in funding. Uh, funds are not enough. What we need to pay much more attention to, I think, are things like uh, governance uh, and accountability. And, and also some of the more detailed aspects, like how do the funds reach, actually reach the facility. It's one thing to uh, have the funds in a budget uh, here in uh, Moresby, but it's another to get the funds uh, actually out to the facility. So yeah, they're mixed results in terms of the last decade, but I think they've got a lot of lessons uh, for PNG's next decade and how to get better uh, performance uh, in the coming years. Resource PNG continues when we return. Welcome back. In the first two segments, we've had a look at how the PNG government has risen to the challenge of ensuring transparency by supporting the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, EITI. In this next segment, we see how the PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum has supported the government's efforts to establish an EITI mechanism. The Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative EITI, is a mechanism for tracking resource rent from payments made by industry to government and payments made by government in the delivery of goods and services. The government, through the Treasury Department, has set up a secretariat which will be assisted by a multi-stakeholder working group consisting of representatives from industry, government and civil society. The Papua New Guinea Chamber of Mines and Petroleum has supported the government's efforts to establish an EITI mechanism. The Chamber recently announced that seven industry players will be represented on the EITI MSG. Executive Director of the PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, Greg Anderson, said that industry has selected its representatives. Each, each of the three parties has seven members, so we will have seven mine, th uh, three mining companies, three petroleum companies, plus the Chamber. The industry has elected Oil Search, ExxonMobil and Talisman from the petroleum sector and Barrick, Octady and Newcrest from the mining sector, along with a representative from the Chamber of Mines and Petroleum to be part of the multi-stakeholder committee of the EITI Secretariat. 
and the government then declared... Mr Anderson said the industry was very supportive of the moves by the government to create an avenue for greater transparency and accountability of the use of resource rent. It's because it's the right of every, all the public, all Papua New Guineans to know what we contribute and what the government receives. According to the PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, between 2005 and 2010, the industry paid 9.69 billion kina in corporate taxes, 1.2 billion kina in dividends, and 1.27 billion kina in dividend withholding taxes. A study by the Australian National University also found that mining contributed 17.2% of total government revenue between 2009 and 2011. Meanwhile, civil society organizations have also elected seven representatives to the EITI multi-stakeholder group that will form the EITI committee. The seven civil society organizations are Transparency International, Institute of National Affairs, Consultative Implementation and Monitoring Committee, Papua New Guinea Mining Watch Inc., Business Against Corruption Alliance, the PNG Eco-Forestry Forum, and the PNG Council of Churches. With the right signals being made by civil society, industry and government, it is hoped that monies will be tracked from receipts to expenditure. Mr. Anderson noted that the government recently committed itself to signing up to the EITI and that the Chamber was working with the government to ensure industry support for the process. We've been a strong supporter of this for quite a number of years and worked very closely with government to, to um, uh, implement the EITI for Papua New Guinea. It's very important to realise that EITI, while it's an international uh, uh, movement, it's, each country adapts it for itself and, and operates it by itself. And essentially what it is is to match what the industry uh, states that it uh, the benefits it contributes to government, the monetary benefits, and the government then declares what it, uh, it receives, and that's independently audited between to match it, and public made public. Papua New Guinea is a resource-rich country, and it is hoped that through the EITI, improvements in transparency and accountability will ensure sustained growth and development of the nation. It is now expected that the Treasurer, Honorable Don Polia, will invite stakeholders from industry and civil society to form the EITI multi-stakeholder group in conjunction with the government. More when we come back. Thanks for staying with us. We now feature an interview with the IPBC Managing Director, Wasantha Kumarasiri. I have with me Wasantha Kumarasiri, the Managing Director of IPBC. It's good to see you again, sir. Good to see you too. Now, congratulations on your new appointment. I understand you're settling in well there. Thank you. Yes, it is. It's been uh, six months since I moved to IPBC. And it's a challenging organisation and also can be an effective organisation to deliver a change. I'm sure you'll have a lot to offer them as well. Um, if I can just uh, start by asking how the IPBC's role is going to change in relation to the Kumul holding structure. Okay. With regard to Kumul holding structure, IPBC as it is now is an organization that has uh, less visibility and uh, less uh, effective control to th make things happen. Under the Kumul holding structure, IPBC will become a corporatized organization, a company, quite similar to the private sector holding company subsidiary structure, mm -hmm. in which case all subsidiary companies, which are all the state-owned enterprises, will become the subsidiaries of this holding company. Under the current uh, draft discussions we have had to draft the legislation. We have highlighted the developments that we look for and also current challenges we have in IPBC structure on its own to be a more delivering organization than a, a passive organization sitting back and watching what is happening. Right. I think uh, 
IPBC will then under the cumul holding structure will become an uh, entity that can uh, effectively manage and also can be an effective organization which can ring fence all the assets and liabilities within that structure to be an assistance to other large uh, expansions in various entities. Currently we have some entities which are very strong, some entities which are very weak, but the strength of the strong company cannot be used to strengthen the weak company. Under the cumul holding structure, that kind of facilities become possible. Will the IPBC's assets be redistributed under the cumul holding structure? The, under the cumul holding structure, currently IPBC do carry various assets and in, in relation to oil and gas as well as uh, other utility services. Under the new cumul structure, IPBC will become non-gas and uh, petroleum mm -hmm. and non-mining assets will remain with IPBC and all assets that we currently hold for mining and petroleum will be distributed to or transferred to the Kumul Mining and also Kumul uh, Petroleum Company. Okay. So with that way that we will hold only the non-mining and non-petroleum assets in IPBC. Now IPBC currently operates under the domain of the Ministry of Public Enterprise and State Investments. Do you have an insight into what the uh, ministerial arrangements for Kumul Holdings will be? The Kumul Consolidated Holding, which is IPBC's transformed organisation, we expect it to be remaining with the Ministry of uh, State uh, Enterprises and uh, Public Enterprises and State Investments. Mm -hmm and uh, I don't, at this stage we don't know, and, but our expectations there will be no change. The National Petroleum Company is currently under the IPBC. What will its role become relative to both the Sovereign Wealth Fund and the Kumul Holdings? Okay, in terms of the Sovereign Wealth Fund and the Kumul Holding rest restructure, uh, those have been uh, separated in the recent past and uh, because those are carried at different level, I think uh, I refrain making any comments on that because uh, it's not uh, correct for me to make those comments. But in terms of the National Petroleum Corporation, the NPCP, NPCP will be a subsidiary of the Kumul Petroleum Holdings Limited. Okay. And uh, so as I said earlier, it will be one of those assets that we will transfer from IPBC umbrella to Kumul Petroleum Umbrella. Okay. So what reforms will you be introducing to the IPBC? Okay. In terms of IPBC, if you look at uh, the recent uh, SME summit, today we have the PNG Advantage and uh, Manufacturers Council. Everyone's complaint is that doing business in Papua New Guinea is very expensive. The delivery of goods and services are expensive or cannot get the reliable services. The IPBC through our board, the board has uh, given the mandate to look at various reforms and IPBC is getting ready with this uh, Kumul holding restructure as well to look at those reforms. We are mainly looking at four areas of reforms. You one is the transport, sp especially the sea transport mm -hmm. and the ports cost of shipping into Papua New Guinea, what role can be there to cut down the cost. Right. So in this regard, we have engaged uh, three studies and uh, those studies will be coming up uh, uh, very soon and with that we expect uh, to look at the reforms into the, the shipping area that's shipping transport. Then in relation to passenger transport, we are also looking at passenger transport uh, reforms and those will go through a due process of review mm -hmm. and uh, expectation is, as we all know that uh, the flying into Papua New Guinea and operating airlines in Papua New Guinea is expensive, but there may be areas where we can restructure where some relief can be achieved. and. Uh, 
I'm sure that if you look at the aviation world in Australia, New Zealand and other parts of the world, they went through a similar process like we are going through. Those uh, reforms they have brought in, brought in through various uh, studies and uh, we are not uh, different to that. So in our view, that area need to be reviewed so that uh, if we have reliable and affordable aviation travel, mm -hmm. there will be more tourism to be developed. And uh, so that will be one of our focus. So that's on the transport, sea transport and the air transport. Other reforms are the communication area reforms. They had the PNG advantage. The discussion took place in creating this company called Data Core, which will hold the key infrastructure assets and to allow competition to come in. More small and medium enterprises to come in. If you go to other parts of the world, there are ISPs, small ISPs, people will come and buy their bulk capacity. Mm -hmm. They create a phone company, they give you a card, you scratch and you call some other part of the world for a very low cost amount. Mm -hmm. So si because he doesn't have overheads. So similar small enterprises can be developed and also communication costs can be brought down. So this is another review that we are carrying out. And the third one is the power, the, the reliability of the power is very important. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the affordability. If we have low cost power and reliable power, there will be industries to come in. The, if you look at the, our unemployed population, unemployed youth is between the grade 8 to grade 11 educated uh, uh, people. Mm -hmm. That's where the largest level of unemployment, which was highlighted at the, the Medang uh, SME summit. There's about 700 to 800,000 uh, people unemployed, and every year, 60 to 80,000 people getting added into that list. So we had to develop industries where the employment can be generated. So the power has, cost of power will make a determination whether to come and invest in this country and create industry or they go elsewhere. Mm. So these are the issues that we are looking at now to in a view to bring the PNG economy into a more robust economy. So the IPBC do have a role to play and uh, SOEs do have a role to play. We can do that only collectively. So this lot of uh, discussions are moving and uh, our internal coherence is also needed between IPBC and its uh, future organization and also state-owned enterprises. The Kumul restructure will provide that platform. So that's what uh, I'm looking forward to that day. And we look forward to those reforms to Wasantha. Thank you for your time today. Wasantha, thank you. Wasantha Kumar Siri, the Managing Director of IPBC. We talked to the State Enterprise Minister. You're back with Resource PNG. In this next interview, Minister Ben Micah defines the role of the State Enterprise Ministry in the PNG economy. I have with me the Honourable Ben Micah, the Minister for public enterprise and state investments. Welcome, it's good to see you again, sir. Thank you, Ani. Now, uh, Minister, you made some uh, statements earlier at a business conference uh, regarding the role of uh, government in economy, uh, specifically to do with uh, state-owned enterprises. Can you please define that role? Well, you know, the economy in Papua New Guinea is uh, traditionally being controlled by the private sector. The government is only being a participant through shareholding in some of the companies, more in the uh, mining and oil and gas sector, and also in some agriculture companies. Also, it was also in the early 70s uh, partner in some of the timber developments. But the private sector has primarily been the driver of the economy in Papua New Guinea. Over the last um, ten years since the reforms of the Moralta government, uh, the former public utility utilities like uh, uh, telecom and mm -hmm. ports and uh, water, post office and also the airline uh, have 
reasonably perform uh, to a level where they are now operating because of the corporatization uh, strategy of the Marauta government, like companies. They are now operating companies, they are making uh, very large uh, revenues, and uh, they are also making profits, which they have not been doing before. So the government is now in business through the state-owned enterprises. Right. Also, uh, with the entry of uh, ExxonMobil and other partners into the oil and gas sector and the development of the PNG LNG project, uh, the country and its economy has now stepped up uh, to, to a level that uh, it is changing uh, you know, the landscape of the economy. Therefore, government, through its ownership of uh, shares in the, this uh, LNG project, is becoming a significant player. So it poses the question, what role does government has to play in the private sector as a owner, but at the same time government has to make laws, government has to come up with regulations uh, to regulate the uh, affairs of the private sector. So a policy document uh, which uh, I have now finalized and is shortly going to cabinet will now define the role of the state as a businessman and the role of the state as uh, uh, owner of business, and then its role as a regulator. Uh, so the policy document will lay those out clearly. Just basically meaning that there are some agencies of government and some ministries that will deal with policy and regulatory mm -hmm. issues, and uh, my ministry will deal with the business issues of the government. Right. To what extent then do landowners and the government become partners in resource development? This is an issue that has been ongoing since the colonials cited uh, our countries and our people and introduced you know, the western ways or modern ways of mm. uh, doing things. Uh, the issue of land ownership has been around for a long time. Uh, the, the foreigners, uh, they always recognize the rights of the indigenous people, you know. They um, uh, acquired land you know, for dubious amounts or mm. dubious things like excess and calico and knives. But uh, that was some form of consideration for land, meaning that they recognized the issue of customary ownership of indigenous people. So when, uh, you know, business uh, began to uh, proliferate and government uh, became more sophisticated, um, this issue of land ownership Mm -hmm. also became sophisticated because there are laws now that define uh, defines the you know different uh, ownership of land what is on the surface uh, what is in minerals below the ground or hydrocarbon or, uh, even forestry uh, resources uh, where the state by law uh, claims ownership rights over this the customary land owners also by tradition and through thousands of years of living and owners owning those land also claim rights to them. And then this government through uh, the legislation that we uh, uh, you know, uh, included in the, the Mining Act and also in the Oil uh, Gas Act uh, also um, uh, transfers the rights to develop these resources to private sector uh, companies who are awarded development licenses. There is contradiction the policy yes. documents seeks to find a path, a much more amicable way that will address the issue of customary owner, address the issue of state, and address the issue of private investors in the uh, ownership and development of uh, natural resources. Do you think there needs to be more policy um, regarding the way forward for landowners? Do you think we, are, we have enough legislation that um, is, 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 should I say, vindicating the rights of landowners? There is already too many legislation uh, that gives rights to landowners. You know. uh, the, the Land Act gives rights to landowners. Also the, the customary uh, registration, uh, you know, um, uh, provisions in the Act, the Land Act, that gives rights to uh, customary owners and which establishes also 
integrated land rules and uh, this SABL process mm -hmm. gives rights to landowners. Uh, however, the issue of contention is uh, other legislation which gives uh, ownership rights to the state. Right. Of resources below certain depth to the state. And this is an issue that is an issue of contention between landowners, between the state, and between uh, uh, private investors. So it is an issue that our policy document is attempting to address and we find a way that uh, may not be acceptable by all but will be reasonably uh, amicable to address uh, the issue of benefits uh, which results in ownership that can be structured more fairly uh, in, 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 in all sectors uh, of the economy. Uh, now this is not only uh, land ownership in terms of uh, extraction of minerals and hydrocarbon assets. Uh, this landowners issues now arising out of uh, ports where ports are built. You know, not long ago the landowners of uh, the customary owners of Lay City uh, blockaded the Lay Port yes. and uh, you know raised issues which mm -hmm. uh, they feel. Uh, they are grieved as a result of uh, PNG ports maybe doing something that does not recognize their, 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 their customary claims. So that is also an issue. Uh, there are also landowners of dams, you know, that are owned by PNG Power. Uh, you know, uh, waterways uh, that uh, you know, um, uh, you know, ships and uh, vessels have to pass mm -hmm. through. That landowners are raising. Uh, for example, the Jomet Passage uh, in the Milan Bay province. I have received very strong letters from Governor Titus Philemon about uh, compensation uh, of the use of the Jomet Passage by international uh, cargo vessels that uh, pass through in large numbers through the Jomet Passage. Destruction to the reefs, uh, discharge of uh, uh, fuel, and uh, other. Uh, garbage into the into the sea in, in, in the provincial waters is also an issue. So it is a broad uh, issue uh, that needs to be addressed, and I believe my policy document will address these these issues. Essentially speaking, uh, everyone that has a right to something must be a stakeholder. That's they must right. Take ownership. That's right. Uh, and I think landowners are becoming more aware that. Um, there is, as you say, there's waste going into the water. There are certain depths of water that we must legislate over. There is all sorts of, all, all, all manner of ownership um, uh, issues that we need to look at very clearly. So thank you for we that. Look at the, look at the, uh, the Panguna crisis, which then led to the Bougainville crisis. That's right. The concerns were not raised by the owners of the mining pit. Mm. They were raised by the owners of the Java River. The villages along the Java River, where the the uh, you know the uh, cyanide and all the uh, cleaning chemicals were being spilled into the Java River, mm. and then the landowners uh, down uh, in the Lolo area, uh, they were the ones who started the complaints, not the mine owners, the landowners in the mine. You see, so everything is related to the land. That's right. And wherever you have people claiming. Right, not only of ownership, but right of living, meaning their life depends on, on the land, or the, or the rivers, or the sea. An issue will arise, and uh, I believe that this is the opportunity now for government, since the resource the boom is now just taking off. Uh, we must establish this clear policy uh, definition of mm. uh, ownership rights, and the role of the state and private investment in the extraction. Uh, and, and development of these uh, resources, then I believe we can be able to establish uh, maybe not the satisfaction on everyone, like I said earlier, but the balance, a certain balance that will create some amicable understanding for a way forward in resource development. Mm. A good policy for, for, for a good way forward. Thank you. Stay tuned for more of Resource PNG. We continue the interview with the State Enterprise Minister, Honourable Ben Michael. Thank you, Minister. Now, you made a statement earlier uh, with the phrase partnership from extraction to market. Can you please uh, explain that? I believe the time has come 
for this generation of Papua New Guineans who are more educated, more knowledgeable, and many have worked in the resource sector, and many uh, also working in other industries that are not related to the resource sector, but also have worked overseas and we are now coming back to the country and we have seen the experience uh, of uh, exploitation and uh, of uh, resources in some other countries, and also in the soil history of our country. Um, we feel that uh, the, the government, on behalf of all the people of Papua New Guinea, landowners, on behalf of um, the people who are living in the impacted areas of the projects, uh, are not getting substantive compensation for the development of resources on their land. Uh, and uh, just by extracting raw material. Uh, and also by, uh, you know, bringing in uh, contractors from elsewhere to develop projects. Uh, you know, a certain time frame is given for extracting a certain uh, gold resource or a certain oil field. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, as you know, the, uh, for, for commercial reasons, the companies have to mobilize manpower, mobilize contractors from all over the world to do these projects. Many times, Papua New Guineans have been missing out on this value uh, heading of, of the chain of the business. Many times, like I said earlier, the uh, land ownership uh, issue uh, uh, raises unfair uh, distribution of the, of the benefits mm. uh, in terms of the real value of these uh, resources to landowners and also to the state. So um, uh, when I say from extraction, I mean that the partnership must begin. Uh, the partnership between landowners, the partnership between state, partnership between private investors must begin from when the resources are coming out of the ground. When the resources are being shipped in raw form to the next phase of processing, we must be also involved in it. Uh, for example, uh, we should become owners of the pipeline of the gas. You know, once it's processed into LNG, uh, we must also become part owners of the LNG ships that ship it to the market. Uh, that is what I mean. Uh, in terms of the extraction of uh, minerals, we should look at uh, adding value to these minerals rather than being shipped to, to, to foreign smelters of the copper and gold we should establish these industries on shore when we partner with foreign investors uh, to ensure that the uh, additional values in the chain of doing this business is kept on shore. It creates more employment, it builds up skills, uh, and also a flow on effect into other sectors of the economy uh, also benefits because uh, uh, jobs and money that is being repatriated offshore is now it kept on shore. Kept on shore. Mm. So mm. that is really the thing. No more, uh, and I say this openly to, to uh, private investors, uh, we should relook at this, this uh, uh, relook at this whole issue. Uh, uh, I think the times for just uh, paying out royalties and special support grants mm. and IDG, which makes up only 1%. Of the, of the of the total revenue that is made from a project, uh, I think I think that Agone. that kind of formula should should move away, and we should more look at how we can participate. And I'm not saying we participate in large amount. If we participate from the whole chain, then we pick up five percent, five percent, ten percent, twenty percent. Then you can see we can skim as much from the fat of the business and reinvest it onshore into other sectors of the economy and create more and more jobs and upskill more and more of our people in industries that otherwise are being kept offshore. Minister, I think there'll be a lot of viewers out there nodding their heads and agreeing vehemently with you. Thank, Thank you for your time today. Thank you. The Honourable Ben Micah, Minister for Public Enterprise and State Investments.
That ends Resource PNG. If you have any comments or queries, do email us on this address, resourcepng at mtv.com.pg. Or to find out more, check MTV online. That's www.mtv.com.pg and go to our Resource PNG page. Or you can check our page on Facebook. Until the same time next week, bye for now.